Well, good morning or whatever time it is for you when you're watching this uh, recording or you may join me uh, online. Uh, greetings to all of you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm glad that we can have this course uh, together, the second part of the church history, church history uh, 105 undergraduate level, mod 6, the year 2020. And today's date is July 6th, the year 2020. Let's start our session and uh, our uh, course with a prayer. Father God, we thank you uh, for another module, for another uh, term that we can study uh, your work throughout history and see your hand throughout human affairs and how your church, in spite of all its weaknesses and sins and shortcomings by your grace by your power your church is moving forward has moved forward throughout centuries and uh, proclaiming your gospel though there were times that uh, the church has failed to do that but thank you but that by your grace uh, the true church is still uh, marching onward and we pray for the day that the uh, church on earth will become the triumphant church and um, by your grace uh, and your presence we enter a new age and new era um, lord help us to look at the history um, of our ancestors spiritual ancestor learn from their mistakes and learn from their uh, good things the positive things that they did and may uh, this course not only be just academic, even though the academia is important, but also spiritual. And may we use the thing that we learn here in this course in our life, in our ministry, for your glory in the various churches that we serve you. For we pray all these things in the Lord Jesus Christ's mighty name, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm glad to have you in our class uh, as i mentioned on uh, uh the let me um just enter so i have to take care of a few things so many notification comes to the computer um i'm glad that we can have uh, this course together and study uh church history from reformation to the present time uh, the second part some of you uh, probably are from the uh, first part so it's a very good continuation before we go to our chapter one uh, let me just go over the syllabus and uh, talk a few things about the syllabus just uh, one moment uh, get that Okay, uh, <clears throat> let's go to share screen. Okay, all right. Um, I hope you're, you are able, I'm sure you're able to see the syllabus on the screen. Um, today is the first day that we start the first session. We continue to August 23rd, the year 2020. And by God's grace, pray that this crisis of Corona will be eased or come to an end by God's grace. As the course explains, um, we are going to do an in-depth study of church history from 1517 to present. But uh, we need to go a little bit beyond 1570 before the, we have to look at the, pro, uh, the events before 1570 to understand the setting for reformation we look at various groups reform movements some of them radical and their influence on the modern church and also on the secular culture around us uh, probably most of you guys know me my name is Sohrab Ramkin um, I here is my educational background I have a BA degree in mathematics 
and be a degree in physics from Point Loma Nazarene University. I got my MDF from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School in Chicago, my THM here at Southern California Seminary, and my Doctor of Ministry again here at Southern California Seminary. Um, I am involved with different ministry. I'm mainly pastoring the Iranian Christian Church of San Diego and El Cajon. I teach at Southern California Seminary and I am involved with the TV and radio ministry, satellite TV ministry to Iran and Afghanistan and radio ministry into the same countries. And by God's grace, we have seen great numbers of people coming to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ in spite of everything else, things that you don't hear in the regular media. Just this last week, we had um, a young man uh, gave his life to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, as far as your textbook, these are your required textbooks. The main textbook is Church History, the second part, second volume by Dr. Woodbridge. Uh, Dr. John Woodbridge was my church history prof at Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. And he was the man that really put the heart, love for church history in my heart. We will continue our study of the book, Our Legacy by Dr. John Hanna um, from Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, and this is more uh, a focus on history of church doct Christian doctrines. And the third thing that I encourage you to have um, is the, this little pamphlet. Um, um, it's a wonderful pamphlet, a track. I encourage you to have Christian history timeline. And of course, our main uh, textbook is the Holy Bible. I have some recommended textbooks to encourage you to if you're interested, if you're, you wanted to be a student of church history to, come, to have them. Um, Dr. Harold O.J. Brown, his book on heresy, and he was my, another prof at Trinity. Uh, Dr. Earl Kearns, this is a wonderful book, uh, Christianity Throughout Century, a wonderful book, one volume. I encourage you to have that. Or also, this is another one volume book on church history, very good one. Uh, Tim Dowley, he's a general editor, it's Erdsman Handbook uh, to the Ch History of Christianity. Dr. Woodbridge has another wonderful book. Uh, it's excellent book for your own devotion, or if you uh, want to have great example for your sermons, uh, I highly recommend this book by Dr. Woodbridge, Great Leaders, of the Christian Church by the Moody Press. If you want to focus more on the life of uh, Martin Luther and the Reformation, Roland Bainton, he is the expert. Uh, he has a biography on the life of Martin Luther, Here I Stand, and also the Reformation of the 16th century by the uh, same author published by Beacon Press. Uh, there is another textbook on church history, Broadbent, uh, Broadbent uh, uh, Church History book, The Pilgrim Church, an account of continuance through the centuries of Christian church, uh, practicing biblical principle taught in the New Testament. Um, this book is unique in a sense that it's written from perspective of uh, pilgrimage brethren. Uh, perspective on church history. Mm, not as a criticism, I, I don't think this is a weakness of the textbook that we have by Dr. Woodbridge or the textbook that we studied last term uh, on church history, but some people criticize these textbooks because they say it mainly focuses on the uh, Roman Catholic Church and then the Protestant Church and that's it. And uh, Broadbent wants to bring about that there were small groups, uh, and it is true, uh, Valdensian and other groups that uh, they were here and there different parts of Europe uh, who were not part of the Roman Catholic Church and were not also 
uh, heretical because some of these uh, smaller groups were heretical, but they were true uh, Bible-believing churches, which is good. It's a good um, uh, textbook to have to, compl to complement our textbooks by Dr. Woodbridge and Dr. Ferguson that we studied last uh, module. Some um, classical books I highly recommend, like uh, this book, Pia Desideria uh, by Philip Spenner, Jacob, um, uh, Philip Jacob Spenner, I highly recommend that for your own devotional time. Books such as you know, Imitation of Christ by Thomas Akampis, um, this book, uh, Pia Desideria. Uh, these are classical books that you will be blessed by reading them. Um, and uh, this book uh, by Robert Walton, The Chart of Church History, is an excellent textbook that gives you, as, uh, puts things in a uh, format of a chart and helps better to understand what's going on in different era of church history. Um, I think some of these things are very clear, self-explanatory, of course, objective, um, methods of instructions, um, you know, because of the uh, corona, all classes at Southern California Seminary, this class and all other classes are offered only online until further notice. Uh, usually when I, we have this, uh, I have this course, I, I emphasize heavily on discussion and you have part of your assignment, the weekly discussion on the discussion board of the populi, uh, please respond to that. Uh, but because, again, this course is offered online and the timing of it might not be the best for everybody, Monday morning, 9 to 12, uh, that uh, a live discussion, I'm not sure how much we will have. Like last module, everybody was just watching the recording. And that's fine, as I mentioned. Uh, on the bulletin board of the class on Populi, uh, you are not required to join me online, uh, but uh, definitely you are required to watch the recordings and ask your questions. So we have lectures, we have weekly quizzes, term paper, midterm, final, and also we have weekly videos. And I will, um, some of them are uploaded, but I will upload different articles, charts, uh, uh, in addition of your reading. I <laughs> know you may say, well, we have enough to read. Uh, we don't need additional one. But these will help you to understand, to get a better grasp of the topic for each session. Uh, your attendance, since this course is online, is true popularly by submitting your uh, assignments. Uh, those things, that, that will count as your uh, attendance. Um, you must have access to Populi, your uh, school email, participate in Populi discussion. Uh, you must finish all the required readings and sign the reading log sheet and turn it in by at the end of the session, the seventh session, see page eight. There are weekly quizzes that I provide a study guide for each quizzes. This is a way I recommend for you to study. Like for each week, you have seven days. Divide the total number of your learning uh, by those seven days. And let me turn off my cell phone. Um, divide your total number of uh, reading for each week by seven. Plan, be, very, be organized to read each day and I recommend I put, I um, uh, organize I, and uh, put for you chapter summary. For each chapter, you have chapter summary that uh, talks about key terms, key points, the summary of the chapter. Uh, I would say first read that and read that carefully, then read your textbook, and then uh, go to the study guide and try to find the answer to the questions from your textbook. Um, I think this is the best way to get the, uh, the best out of this course. The 
video session for uh, previous years, like the year 2019, it's also there if you want to watch that and get some additional information. Because in 2019, this course was offered as a community class um, through the seminary. So there was a large group of people attending the course uh, and uh, we had guests a speaker. So you may want to uh, use that uh, previous last year a video a recording also. I, I encourage you to do that. Um, yeah, there is a term paper and um, that term paper is due session seven, but on session six, I need to have your detailed outline of your paper uh, so that I can, if there is any uh, change that needs to be made, I can tell you before you uh, get into the paper itself. And you must pick one of the topics here. You cannot just choose whatever you want. One of these uh, five topics. The impact of Renaissance on the church during the era of 14th through 16th century, or the cause, the development, and the consequences of the Reformation, the role and the impact of Martin Luther on the process of the Reformation, the cause, the development, and the consequence of the Enlightenment on Christianity, and the importance and the impact of Karl Barth on Christianity. Uh, let me also make it clear, this is part of the uh, guideline by Trubian format. The, your paper must be in the Trubian format. And also regarding uh, quotation. Uh, for example, if you are using the third topic, the role and impact of Martin Luther on the process of reformation, and you want to discuss uh, some of his, those 95 theses, uh, that is fine, but I don't want you to just copy and paste all the 95 theses for me. The purpose of the paper is to help you, and I'm going to grade you on your understanding of process of reformation. I'm not planning to grade Dr. Martin Luther, uh, so, don't just copy and paste, somebody did that in previous years. Uh, don't just copy and paste the 95 theses to uh, fill pages and uh, you know, meet the requirement for the uh, uh, limit of uh, you know, the, ten, uh, the number of uh, pages for the paper. The paper should be at least uh, 10 pages, but you can have more using Trubian format. And you need to use at least five sources. You can include your textbook as one of them, but five sources must be used. Okay, um, there are help if you have question about Truby and Format. Uh, there are resources on Populi that you can look and submit your papers, everything through Populi, because it must be checked for plagiarism. And I hope you will not have problem with that. Then the final exam is session seven um, that you take it online. It covers from midterm onward. It covers session five, six, and seven. The midterm covers session one, two, three, and four, and final from five to seven. It will not go back to the beginning. Um, the library resources here, you can go and find different resources that we have online. And I think in a limited way, the library is still available. If you physically need to access some books at the library, check with our librarian. And here is the schedule and uh, the, the uh, points, um, discussions, 50 points, reading your textbooks, 50 points, Detail outline 50 points, research paper 200, quizzes 200, midterm 200, and final exam. Okay, I think this should be clear. If you have any question, feel free to ask and uh, send your question to me via email or via pocket. Okay, let's uh, 
let's start with chapter one. And then after that, I want us to watch our video. And, um, you know, we are supposed to have about uh, <clears throat> 20 minutes of break. So I, I'm going to divide that between these uh, three hours period that we have uh, for each art about five to seven minutes break. I need that myself, especially when, <laughs> uh, when there's no uh, student physically present. Uh, it is very difficult to talk uh, nonstop for 180 minutes or 140 minutes, okay? So let's go to chapter one uh, here. <clears throat> okay, and let me go to share screen. Okay, now uh, let's make this. Okay. We come to chapter one um, and our focus is on um, uh, 1300 to 1500 the late Middle Ages, which is also called the period of decline of church, uh, of papacy, decline of the uh, Catholic Church. Um, there were many factors involved in this period of time that caused it to be called the age of adversity. Uh, there was uh, massive uh, uh, devastation of war, famine, and plagues. For the people, the European Christians in the late Middle Ages, the conviction that God's purpose guided uh, the unfolding of history was severely tested in this age of um, suffering, deep personal suffering, catastrophic event, and scandals in the church, in the Roman Catholic Church. You got to remember what was before this period. If you remember from your church history last session, the, we had the almost 200 years of those terrible uh, crusader wars. We end up in disaster, ended up with losing the Holy Land to the Islamic army and all kind of corruption caused the uh, uh, permanent separation between the church in the west and the east. Um, the crusader army damaged the uh, eastern orthodox church and uh, Byzantine empire badly. They per the, I mean the idea was to free the holy land from the hand of the infidels, the Muslim, which in itself was a mistake. Uh, but beside that, uh, the crusader army, they attacked the Christian brothers in the Eastern Empire, they attacked, killed, uh, pillaged, and damaged uh, the uh, Byzantine Empire and many uh, centers of the Eastern Orthodoxy. Beside the persecution of the Jewish, horrible, horrible persecution of Jewish people during that time, to the point that both Eastern Orthodox Christians and the Jews have made this confession that things were much, much better uh, either under the Muslim or under the communists later in the 20th century. Uh, and that's such a, it tells you a bad testimony of what happened during the Crusader War. Now the Crusader had some, the, as I mentioned in the last session, the only uh, positive thing that came out of the Crusader War uh, was not that the, not that it is again don't make a mistake no I'm not saying that it started only during the Crusader but the Crusader war uh, accelerated that and that was the contact between European Christian scholars and the Muslim scholars in North Africa in Baghdad and the transfer of Greek texts which were uh, originally went from 
uh, Europe from uh, Greek language to Syriac and then translated from Syriac to Arabic. And then through these contacts that uh, started even before the Crusader War, but during the Crusader War, uh, the contact become much more. They were uh, transferred back to Europe, translated into Latin, and that was the thing that influenced uh, some of the movement in Europe, such as the scholastic movement and the Renaissance movement. Uh, even though Renaissance um, uh, had, uh, you know, conflict with the scholastic way of thinking, but nevertheless, both of them were influenced by the uh, writings of the ancient philosophers such as Aristotle, Plato, and uh, which the whole thing went transfer from Europe to Middle East and then coming back uh, to Europe again. But, you know, you had this horrible uh, background of the Crusader War, almost 200 years, and, you know, and then you had famine, you had wars in Europe, and these church scandals corruption in the uh, in the uh, Roman Catholic Church. Something that you got to remember that there were two major elements that uh, tied together the European culture. One was the uh, having a Christian empire, a Christian emperor, uh, and then the papacy, having a king, and a spiritual leader, religious leader. Now, what happened during the 13th through 1500, the uh, one unified uh, Christian emperor that was dominion all over Europe, that was uh, crumbling. There were rise of nationalism. Uh, there, are sick, uh, there are kings, monarch, princes in different parts of Europe that they were more thinking of their own region, uh, British, French, German, Scandinavian, and Italian. At the same time, the power of papacy was going through a crisis. So uh, that's the period of time that we, uh, we will get to it. I'll talk about it more, but especially with the power coming to the power of Pope Boniface VIII, uh, and his confrontation with the uh, secular monarchs in France and England, uh, you have the decline of the papacy that uh, put uh, that give uh, impetus, that gives motivation, that plants a seed for the Reformation movement. So you have these times of uh, deep personal sufferings church scandals, wars, famine, uh, wars, the plagues, uh, you know, war is something costly um, and damages, you know, the old, all the 200 years of Crusader War had its toll on the European culture and the European economy. Um, and what the, this whole thing uh, caused the European Christians to look at the world and think as all these things that are happening as uh, activity of an unseen war. There are evil forces in the cosmos, or they will look at it as a divine judgment, divine judgment that we fail to free the uh, Holy Land, divine judgment that, uh, you know, because of the corruption in the uh, papacy and different things. Uh, so many people lived in a constant fear of physical, um, uh, perils and spiritual adversity, uh, and both within and outside the church, this area, this period of time is considered the age of adversity. Um, as I have it in your um, PowerPoint, there are the political challenges to a united Christendom, uh, Rome's centrality in peril, increasing local alliance to kings and princes, and, uh, you know, then we had this whole uh, story of the experience of Pope Boniface VIII. So what happened when Pope Boniface VIII came to power in the beginning of 14th century? 
he had in his mind the example of the uh, innocent the third a uh, strong pope before him um, centuries before him and he had the experience he had in his mind the experience of how uh, innocent the third will rule and will uh, bring to submission the secular monarch so he had the same idea to do the same thing and uh, uh, what he started by declaring in the in the year um, 1300 the year of jubilee now it's interesting you know the concept of the year of jubilee goes back to the old testament book of deuteronomy that every um, uh, the fiftieth year, uh, after seven seven years, the fiftieth year was supposed to be the year of jubilee for the Jewish people. That all debt will be cancelled, and this was a principle that God had put in the, in in the law, and we have it in the year in the book of Deuteronomy, so that uh, you know generation after generation will not live under economical and financial bondage uh, what the roman catholic church wanted to do and pope boniface the third wanted to do not that to cancel personal debt but to cancel uh, payment from people for buying indulgences or penance for the forgiveness of their sins so you because you had to pay the church by these indulgences penance uh, for the forgiveness of your sins. Pope Boniface VIII uh, declared that, first of all, declared that this year of Jubilee will come every hundred years, uh, as opposed to the book of Deuteronomy that says every 50th year. And says if people come to either uh, uh, Cathedral of St. Paul or Cathedral of St. Peter uh, in faith and submission, uh, the, your sins will be forgiven and you don't need to pay anything. Um, and he considered himself uh, like, a, like a monarch. I mean, when he started uh, this event, he would come and say, I am the Caesar, I am the emperor. And uh, he, he, uh, you know, he really thought that he has such a power um, and uh, he could do that. Uh, another textbook I recommend is by Bruce L. Shelley, a church history in plain language. Uh, Dr. Shelley writes that on February 22nd, 1300, Pope Boniface VIII proclaimed the Jubilee, a holy year, to celebrate the new uh, centenary of the Christ's birth. And uh, so uh, and he would come, he would uh, put a royal, uh, imperial robe. Uh, and he will come to the city of Rome, different to the street, and call and says, I am Caesar, I am the emperor. Now, what is happening right now in this period uh, was a change in European economic system. The world economic system was moving, changing from feudalism to commercialism. And later on, we have industrial revolution, and each of these events had its impact on the culture, on the society, and on the church. Same in our time, right now in the year 2020, we have a change in economy. The economy is changing from physical contact to more and more a cyber economy, as you are taking these courses only online for, for the time being. Now, I know the pandemic. Uh, my, you know, accelerated that, but the idea was there, the process was already going on. You know, uh, so the changes were happening in Europe. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ in Mark chapter 4, verses 26 through 29, uh, gives a, 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 one of his parables, the parable about a man who scatters seed on the ground night and day, whether the man was asleep or awake, the seed. Uh, um, sprouted and grew and um, you know at the times uh, man had no idea how the grain grew uh, but the soil simply produced the stock then the head then the kernel uh, and uh, this was going on and the Lord used this parable to teach about the kingdom of God 
So the same thing was happening in Europe uh, in a much, much smaller scale. And in the church, there were seeds and changes where it was going on in Europe and in the papacy. Unfortunately, those in power in papacy were asleep and were not aware of what's, what was going on. Basically what happened was uh, the, the kings and the monarch in Europe, uh, uh, King Philip IV and Edward the Sail, uh, Philip IV in France and Edward I, Edward uh, in England, uh, they noticed the change in economy, that the wealth was moving from uh, feudalism to commercialism. In other words, it is not now how much land you have, but how much money, coin, uh, that became the uh, symbol and sign of wealth. So they wanted to increase their wealth, their uh, currency, uh, their cash in hand um, uh, by taxation. They wanted to have more income to finance their wars or finance the different expenses of their court. So they thought, what should we do? They thought about the church. We are going to tax the church. And that was the thing that brought confrontation between Pope Boniface VIII and uh, Edward I and King Philip IV in, uh, Edward I in England and Philip IV uh, in France. And uh, so the idea basically the idea of a single Christian republic was fading away. And uh, now a, si a single Christian republic ruled by the emperor and by Pope as Christ vicar on earth was moving away, was giving away to local uh, commitment to kings and princes and independent nation state and city state. The idea of a secular and sacred wasn't fully developed, but people were starting to think that way, that there are things that are secular, uh, state-related, and there are things that are related to the church, which papacy opposed that strongly. Boniface VIII didn't want that to happen. Um, when Edward I and Philip IV uh, started to taxing the church, Boniface VIII responded by um, excommunicating them, by threatening them, uh, by forbidding the clergy to pay taxes to the secular government. Now, those uh, uh, the rulers were not like the rulers of the 200 years ago when like the, the one that Innocent III were, was facing and were, uh, they were submitting themselves finally to the power of the Pope. These guys said no. They responded, and the response was that if uh, the church doesn't pay its taxes, we are going to confiscate their property. Uh, um, um, Philip IV, in fact, forbid the transfer of any kind of money or precious metals to uh, Vatican, and they responded heavily to strongly, and uh, uh, they were not threatened by uh, Boniface VIII uh, you know, threat of the interdict uh, or um, excommunication. And Boniface had to back, uh, back down. He, uh, he, uh, he felt that he cannot deal with these two people. And, uh, and then later on, um, he thought uh, during the year of Jubilee, you see where he declared the year of Jubilee um, um, in uh, 1300, and he wanted this to go on for a uh, number of years, uh, for a few years at least. Uh, he wanted uh, this ju uh, Jubilee celebration to continue. When he saw the um, attraction of people, the, the way that people were responding to him, he was so overjoyed that he really taught that, that he has the political power to confront these secular kings like Edwards and uh, Philip IV in France. 
And as a result, uh, you know, he wanted to, uh, he started threatening them, uh, you know, the, this tension going back and forth between them. Uh, and as a result, then uh, uh, King of France sent its troops while Boniface VIII was uh, going to a city outside Rome uh, 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 and was just sheltering himself over there. The soldiers of uh, 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 Frank, uh, uh, Philip IV came and basically they arrested the Pope and they beat him up, physically humiliated him to the point that the people of that city uh, had to rise up and come to the rescue of the Pope. And he was so badly beaten up by uh, Philip the Fourth soldier that he died about three weeks after that event in the year 303. Um, so the result of this humiliation, Boniface humiliation, stunned everybody and single changes in a long standing of political loyalty in Europe. You know, the idea of a, a single Christian Republic ruled by an emperor uh, and by the Pope as a Christ vicar on earth was again giving away to commitment to local kings and princes. People start thinking that we are French, we are German, we are English or whatever. So the papacy was weakened. And this weakening of the papacy became even more apparent with the guy who came after Boniface VIII, Pope Clement V in 1309. He decided uh, to relocate the papacy from Rome to a city in a French territory called Avignon. Uh, he was a French uh, a cardinal. He had the support of the uh, Philip IV, the King of France. So he wanted to, he moved the papacy to Avignon. And this was, be, became known in church history because the, the papacy moved to Avignon for 72 years. And this period of history is known as Babylonian captivity of the church, uh, using the same terminology from uh, Babylonian captivity of Israel in the Old Testament for seven years. Now, uh, Clement uh, benefited, uh, was supported by the French monarch and the departure from the Rome was seen as by many of the contemporaries as only a political maneuver by French monarchy to control the papacy. So there, as I said, uh, there was a poet called Petrarch described this period of time, the Babylonian captivity of church uh, that uh, continued from 1309 to 1377. Seven popes lived in Avignon, in a city uh, near the French, just, just outside the French territory. Many Europeans resented this and they felt this was a direct influence, maneuver, manipulation by French uh, over the papacy and uh, the rise of nationalism in other parts of Europe uh, challenged not only the papacy, but also uh, even if one secular monarch like, uh, and I, when I use the term secular, um, I have to be careful because the idea of a secular versus, scare, uh, versus sacred was not uh, developed as we have it in our time. Uh, but I'm saying more temporal, maybe that's a better term, temporal ruler. Um, so the, the rise of nationalism not only challenged the papacy, but would also challenge any temporal ruler like King of France if uh, he wanted to have a uh, monopoly of influence over papacy. Many in the church linked the ravages of the war, you know, this period of time, the age of adversity, this period of war, famine, and plague, many thought that this is God's judgment for moving papacy from Rome to Avignon, and uh, they were different people called for the end of this captivity. And finally, in the year 1377, with Gregory XI, uh, he returned, the Pope Gregory XI returned to Rome, but very soon he died. 
and uh, then it started another crisis, the, the great schism within the uh, uh, within the church. Okay, the public scandal of the great schism uh, that we, we ended up having. At one point, we had three popes ruling, and you know, I had a class one time and a student as well. Who is the pope at this time? I said, "Well, pick your choice." And there were three popes, and you know, for some people, and this student was coming from the Catholic background. Uh, so you know, the idea of uh, you know, the Catholic Church has been always unified, and there has been always one pope. That's not true. There were this in this uh, 14th century. Uh, the end of the 14th century, beginning of 15th century, you had what is called the Great Schism, and we ended up actually having three popes. Uh, after Gregory XI died in 1378, you know, French cardinal, uh, they were upset, they contested the election of an Italian pope. Uh, you know, the Italian wanted to uh, make a move, they choose Urban the uh, uh, Urban the sixth as a pope, but the French opposed that, and they wanted him to be abdicated. So they choose Clement the seventh to be the pope. So we have Clement the seventh as a pope supported by the French, and then we have Urban the sixth as a pope supported by the Italian. We have two popes, and they excommunicated each other, and there was a military conflict between them. Uh, you know, Urban was uh, ruling from Rome, Clement was ruling from Avignon. So you have two popes, and this was the beginning of the great schism that started in 1378 and going all the way to 1417. Yeah, I wanted to mention something before I continue. Regarding the Pope Boniface VIII, that he changed the year of Jubilee to every hundred years. Uh, just something beside, it's not part of the church history study that we are doing. Uh, some of you may know, I have mentioned this, there is a, a, a gospel, which is a forgery, uh, called the Gospel of Barnabas. Now, this is different from the Epistle of Barnabas uh, that goes back to the fourth century. That epistle of Barnabas and uh, also a gospel of Barnabas uh, that is listed in a, uh, uh, books that are forbidden uh, in the fourth century. The, the reason that those books were forbidden had to do with their Gnostic nature. But this gospel of Barnabas that I'm talking about, there is a copy of that in uh, Royal Library of Vienna, and it's basically a Islamic uh, gospel. <laughs> it's a forgery, and uh, you may, if you ever work among the Muslim, you may come to contact and hear about that. And the reason that we know it's forgery, beside many, many literary problem, textual problem, is the fact that in this gospel of Barnabas, uh, it mentions that the year of Jubilee comes every hundred years. But right after the time of Boniface VIII, the Catholic Church again changed the year of Jubilee to every 50th. So there was only this window of the short period of time under Boniface VIII that the year of Jubilee was changed from every 50th year to every 100th year. And, um, uh, and the, the Gospel of Barnabas, which is Islamic Gospel, it's claims that uh, Muhammad was foretold by the by Jesus, denies Jesus being the son of God and all that, it mentions in that gospel that the year of Jubilee comes every hundred years. So when we put these elements, these factors together, we can say that the gospel of Barnabas, this forgery, Islamic forgery, comes from the 14th century. I have nothing to do with Barnabas of the book of Acts. Anyway, I just thought to mention this uh, before we continue. Going back, let's go back to this great schism. So we have one pope in Avignon, another pope 
in Rome and they are excommunicating each other and uh, each claiming to be legitimate Pope and Vicar of Christ and they're, they were fighting with each other. That caused uh, the church to think of, you know, we have to solve this problem and the solution that they thought was to form conciliar movement, movement of councils. Let's have councils to decide who is the uh, legitimate pope. The rise of the conciliar movement, uh, claiming that the church power, uh, power is vested in the entire congregation of the faithful, which is not bad, you know, that's a good idea and should be exercised through councils. And the initial, what unfortunately, uh, <laughs> the problem was it's not like uh, the believers had a saying in this conciliar movement, actually were the same cardinals and bishop who were uh, just uh, uh, trained in Roman Catholic uh, theology. Because this conciliar movement, one of the Thing that they did out of it came Council of Constant, which was responsible for martyrdom of John Huss. <clears throat> Conciliar movement was a response to schism. They said the power of papacy, actually the power of the church came from the entire congregation of faithful and should be exercised through council. Uh, so in 1409, uh, they formed a council uh, in the city of Pisa and deposed two reigning pontiff, two reigning popes, and elected a third one, Alexander V as pope. So <laughs> now we have three popes, one, uh, you know, Alexander V, uh, then we have Clement VII, and then we have also Urban VI, because the two other popes rejected this decision of the uh, Council of Pisa and they continue to claim to, to be uh, Pope. So we have now three Popes, each with loyal following in certain parts of Europe, and this problem continued until the Council of Constance in 1414 through 1418, that they, what they did, they just, uh, um, at the Council of Constance, uh, they uh, just, <laughs> depose all of these popes and heal the schism, uh, but they elected Martin V as the new pope. Um, but again, what happened was Martin V, once he got into power, he canceled the conciliar movement. He canceled the, the decrees of Council of Constant because he said uh, that it's the pope that gives power and meaning to any uh, council. So that great schism was uh, ended, but then some, some horrible things also happened and you know, other things. And one of them was the uh, killing of the John Haas. Now, in order to understand John Haas, you've got to understand uh, John Wycliffe in England because Haas was strongly influenced by Wycliffe teaching in England, um, uh, but they were different. There are quite a number of differences between the two of them. But anyway, uh, the Council of Constant silenced uh, John Haas. He was a Bohemian priest. They uh, opposed Haas because of teaching that Christ and the scripture had the final authority over church doctrine. Uh, so, Haas was finally uh, burned as a heretic in 1415, uh, and that sparked revolt among the su his supporters in Bohemia. Bohemia would be the present Czech Republic uh, in Europe, uh, that region. <clears throat> uh, and then the final goal of the Council of Concept, now I will go back after we watch the video, I want to go back and talk about Wycliffe and Haas uh, more because these are the two important figure. These are like pre-reformers that paved the way for what Martin Luther and Calvin and others did. Uh, 
Huss um, the final, you know, so the Council of Constant put to death through the uh, John Haas, uh, they acknowledged, the Council of Constant acknowledged the need for reform in the church. They issued a number of decrees for regular meeting of the council to defend the orthodox faith and a fight against heresy and corruption. But uh, eventually uh, the papacy put an end to the conciliar movement. Uh, uh, you know, uh, Eugenius the uh, the court, uh, he was the one that basically put an end to the conciliar movement. The decade following the Council of Const uh, Constance uh, saw the rise of Renaissance folk. What you have is now, uh, after uh, this whole age of uh, adversity, you all also have the age of discovery. You see the popes becoming more interested in arts, painting. You know, they are losing their political power. They are losing their military power. So they turn into arts and literature and um, uh, through these elements through these media wanted to portray uh, their power. You know, you have great painters, Michelangelo, Raphael, uh, that some of the masters who supported uh, their these Renaissance pope. So we have the age of, um, you know, this is Michelangelo painting on Sistine Chapel. Um, they, they, they wanted to refurbish Rome. Um, and uh, deal, you know, uh, de repair the damage done to tackle our, our reputation, uh, and by culture attract uh, Roman culture to attract the devotion of the um, faithful. Uh, you also have during this time the rise of the Turkish Ottoman Empire. Um, you know, the, those two hundred years of Crusader War. Uh, and the sack of Const uh, the you know the, say, we talked about the sack of Constantinople in 1453 by the Turkish Ottoman Empire, but Constantinople was sacked before, before that by so-called Christians from the West during the Crusader War. Those attacks, uh, instead of freeing the Holy Land, the attacks against the uh, and Eastern Roman Empire weakened the Byzantine Empire or the Eastern Roman Empire to the point that in 1453, finally, uh, the city of Constantinople fell to the uh, Turkish Ottoman Empire and came under the power and influence of the Muslim uh, Turkish Sultan. Sultan means king in Arabic language. And that caused the, ort the center of Eastern Orthodoxy to move north toward Russia. And that's why you have the rise of the Russian Orthodox churches. Now, this period of time, and, and you see the history, the, you have all these connections uh, within the history. One event causes and affects another event. Uh, we call that the age of adversity, but also it's a, it, this event, even the capture of the Constantinople, the capture of the uh, large area of the Middle East and North Africa by the Islamic army, caused uh, European to look for different uh, uh, commercial routes to do their business. It gave rise to the age of discovery. Uh, age of discovery emerged in the 15th century as an era of increased sea exploration by the European and Asian nation. Uh, the age of discovery was made possible because of the improvement in technology, in shipping and uh, navigation, the demand for unique goods, and also because these, there were areas that now taken over by the Turkish Ottoman so uh, the European responded 
by trying to uh, discover new trade routes to replace those that are not controlled by the Turkish Ottoman. Um, again, in 1453, the, the Turkish Ottoman captured uh, Byzantine Empire capital Constantinople and they changed the name to Istanbul. Uh, and uh, yeah, that caused the realignment in the Eastern Orthodox Church and uh, the, uh, the Byzantine Empire was oriented toward Islam and then also you have the center of Eastern Orthodoxy to move north to Russia. Uh, but this European discovery also had usually, unfortunately, in most part, had negative effect on the people who came into contact with European. Uh, 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 one thing before we go here, wanted to mention when the Turkish, they captured the city of Constantinople, they changed the name to the name that we have now, Istanbul. I have mentioned this before. The name Istanbul is actually comes from a Greek phrase. Uh, the Turks would hear during the Byzantine Empire that the Greek-speaking uh, citizen of uh, Byzantine, when, when they wanted to go to Constantinople, they would say, uh, I'm going to the city. And it was clear by saying, I'm going to the city, I'm going, that meant that I'm going to Constantinople. Now, to the city, in Greek language, Istapolis was the way that they would say it. And the, the Turks, when they would hear that constantly, Istapolis, Istapolis, uh, they couldn't pronounce it correctly. So it just came, they taught the name of this city is Istapolis or Istanbul. The name Istanbul comes from that Greek phrase, Istapolis, to the city. Uh, okay, by the end of the fifth century, uh, the papacy survived some decades of you know, strong adversity, then Renaissance discovery to maintain its visible role as a supreme head of the unified Christendom. And at the same time, there's a shift in European politics toward a strong regional monarch. And that caused the tension between regional monarch and the papacy. Uh, but, you know, the things were going down the hill uh, for, uh, for the papacy. Let me see. Before we go, just uh, so if we look at the decline of the Middle Ages, starting from 1200, uh, we have Innocent III and the Fourth Lateran Council, and he came. He was an Iron Fist Pope. Then you come to 1300, Boniface VIII. He thought he could act like Innocent III, but he couldn't. Uh, he challenged Edward I and Philip IV, kings of England and France, and he had uh, he was pushed back. And uh, as I mentioned, he uh, while he went to a city near uh, Rome, Anate, uh, the, the French soldiers of Philip IV came and found him, and. Uh, beat him up actually, and uh, he died just a few weeks after that. And this was a horrible humiliation for a Pope. Uh, something like this had never happened before. Um, and, uh, you know, it was only the people of Anate, uh, Anania that, uh, um, uh, who came to his rescue. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, it's Anania, it's a French war. Uh, who came to his rescue. Um, and um, um, so you have, with the death of Boniface VIII, then you have the Babylonian captivity. The papacy moved from Rome to Avignon, stayed there for 72 years. That's the time you have 
Wycliffe in England, and we'll, I will get to that more. Uh, and then John Haas in Bohemia, or uh, what, what is known today as Czech Republic. And we end up having three popes at the same time, the great schism, the schism which uh, finally by the Council of Constance ended and they elected Martin V as a pope. But later on, both Martin V and the other popes uh, right here, like Eugenius the Fourth, they put an end uh, to the power of conciliar movement. And here we start having, you know, the, I, it became clear that a reform of the Catholic Church from within is impossible. And that gave rise to Wycliffe, Haas, and they planned the seed for the Reformation. So let's watch our video and then we will continue. So let me, yeah, and <laughs> your past or uh, break time, but let's watch the video and then we'll take a break. All right. Any of you that are watching this may be inventors, but let's suppose you are an inventor and you invent a time machine that you can go back anywhere in history you want to. Now, I'm not going to tell you what century to go to, but I do want to tell you what century to stay away from. Stay away from the 14th century. Don't go back to the 1300s, whatever you do. Don't even be tempted to turn that dial on your time machine back to the 1300s. Now, I'm not saying that there was nothing good in the 1300s. There was, for example, the beauty of Gothic architecture in the 1300s, beginning all the way back a couple of centuries earlier, continuing well into the 1300s and beyond. There was Gothic architecture, these buildings, because these cathedrals that were intended by the very way they were built to draw people's eyes upward to consider the glory of God. Because at a time when people couldn't read, couldn't write, icons and architecture told them God's story and pointed them to God's glory. So with something this great going on, why not go back to the 14th word to consider the glory of God? Okay. Uh, the reason I wanted to go back, wanted to share something. When you look at this picture, I mentioned that in the last module, this Gothic structure, that is a, a true element of the scholastic movement that happened in that uh, period of time in the Middle Ages. You know, a scholastic movement 
which was affected by the bringing back the, uh, the books, the Greek texts of the um, uh, uh, Greek philosophers from Middle East to Europe. The idea was this, when you look at this picture, what do you see? You see these great structure moving toward sky, reaching out to heaven, okay? And at the same time, you see these great windows, okay? these huge, huge, beautiful uh, stained glass windows. This is a scholasticism. A human, by you, you know, again, this is impacted by Aristotelian logic that came into Europe. Human, by using their uh, logic, wanted to reach out to God. And then we know that, you know, the, the book of Corinthians tell us that no man can know God by his, his own wisdom. We need revelation from God. These windows is a symbol of those uh, revelations. His structure pointing north is a symbol of human logic and wisdom trying to reach out to God. And these windows is uh, that let the light come in. Uh, let's move on for example. Uh, because of that. Like here, these windows that let the light come in as a symbol of letting the light of God, the revelation of Jesus to shine upon human knowledge. So this whole structure would present the meaning of the scholastic movement. Now, this came later on in uh, kind of a confrontation with human renaissance, because in human uh, and even Christian renaissance, the idea was we go to the text, we go to the original writing and let the text, let the discovery direct our path rather than just pure human logic. In my opinion, they can be both. You need, uh, there's nothing wrong with human logic, provided it's enlightened by faith, and also going back to the text and drawing your understanding from the text. This is actually two methods of investigation that we have in many scientific fields, deduction and induction. Okay, let's continue our video. Time when people couldn't read, couldn't write, icons and architecture told them God's story and pointed them to God's glory. So with something this great going on, why not go back to the 14th century? Well, in the 14th century, even as the cathedrals were soaring up into the sky, pretty much everything else was falling apart. For example, if you went back to the 14th century, you would find that the Pope abandoned the city of Rome. You'd find a war that lasted more than 100 years. You'd find a plague that killed a third of the population, and you would find corruption going through and through many areas of the church. So let's look at the 14th century and understand exactly what was going on then and how that shaped the church then and the church now. First off, let's take a look at the Pope and how the Pope ended up leaving Rome. Well, let's start the story with Pope Boniface VIII, when in 1302, he issued a statement called Unum Sanctum, for one holy church. Now, what he declared in this is that the Pope possessed power over all of Europe's kings. Now, not, not surprisingly, that did not go over well with all of Europe's kings. What he declared in this is that the gospel teaches us that the church has in her power two swords, the spiritual and the temporal. Both, he said, are in the power of the church. Now, the French king disagreed so strongly that he had the pope kidnapped. And one month later, Boniface VIII and all of his lofty claims were dead. So the successor of Pope Boniface VIII was Pope Benedict XI. He had a very fruitless reign and a very fruitful death in one sense. He died because somebody served him a plate of poison figs. Now, the Pope after him, Pope Clement V, took the papacy all the way over to Avignon. He left Rome behind completely and went to a village named Avignon, which was on the French border. And there, for about 72 years, the popes lived it up, absolutely lived it up. Bishops openly sold their positions of leadership. The friars freely hawked indulgences. Celibate priests became a pious memory. There was corruption deeply embedded in many areas of the Roman Catholic Church. So not only was there corruption, not only did the Pope flee all the way over to France, 
but also there was war in the 14th century, the war that never ends, or at least it had to have seemed that way to the people during that time period. In 1337, the King of England claimed that he was also the King of France, which not surprisingly did not go over well with the King of France. And so began the Hundred Years' War, although they didn't call it that then because they didn't know how long it would last. And plus, it was 116 years, which clearly suggests there were no mathematicians involved in this war. According to a recent survey, 12% of Americans think Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. Now, if you're one of that 12%, we have some disappointing news for you. Joan of Arc was never on the Ark. She was called Joan of Arc because her father's name was Jacques de Arc. She was a peasant girl born in eastern France, and she believed that she got a personal message from two saints and from Michael the Archangel. Her mission? Throw the English out of France during the Hundred Years' War. As she told the French prince about her vision, received an army, retook the city of Orleans, and turned the French prince into a king. That's when she wanted to go home, but the king said, no, she's got to keep fighting. In the year 1430, she was wounded and captured near the French border. It embarrassed the French king to admit he owed his crown to a peasant girl, so he didn't even ransom her. An English bishop bought Joan and confined her in a dungeon. And she recanted once, but then the bishops returned her to the dungeon again, and finally, the Inquisition convicted her of heresy. She said she heard the saints' voices again at some point, and soldiers then burned Joan of Arc alive. And 25 years after her death, the Pope decided the church had been wrong about Joan the whole time, and in 1920, she was recognized as a saint. But in all of that, she never set foot on Noah's Ark. Now let's suppose for a moment that despite my better judgment of what I've suggested, that you did take that time machine, and in that time machine, you went back to the 1300s you're going to find that corruption reigned in many areas of the church. You're going to find that the Pope has fled to Avignon from Rome. You're going to find a war that kept going on and on. And not only that, if you get there around 1347, there's a good chance you're going to die because about one out of three people in Europe died during the Black Plague. Consider for a moment, if you had landed in Constantinople, the plague killed 88% of the population. In Paris, 800 people died daily. In London, so many corpses were rotting in the streets that nobody could keep track of how many there were. And one man wrote later, no bells tolled and nobody wept, no matter what his loss, because almost everyone expected death. What had happened was is that a flea somewhere from somewhere east of Europe had brought in a disease that had swept across Europe. And so many people died, as many as 24 million people may have died during this time. And so the 14th century, you have disease, you have corruption, you have war, and you have a pope who is not in Rome anymore, but in Avignon. And we haven't even got barely past the halfway point of the 14th century. Now, these 72 years or so that the Pope ended up spending in Avignon with all the corruption going on in the church later became known as the Babylonian captivity of the Roman Catholic Church. So how did the Pope get back to Rome? Well, much of it had to do with a woman whose name was Catherine of Siena. Now, Catherine of Siena was a Dominican nun, a nun of the Dominican order. And she served her community, she served the town of Siena, even when Black Death had struck in her town, she had refused to leave. And she began to call the Pope to come back to Rome from Avignon. Now the Pope at this time was Pope Gregory XI, and over and over and over she called him to come back, come back to Rome. One of the letters that she had sent to him read thus, my dearest Papa, forgive my presumption in saying what I've said. This is Christ's will, Father. Come back. If you abandon me by taking displeasure and indignation against me, I will hide in the wounds of Christ crucified, whose representative you are, and I know that he will receive me. And finally, in the year 1377, Pope Gregory XI came back to the city of Rome. Now, of course, it seemed like with that, that everything was okay now, that the ruptures were healed and that the Roman Catholic Church was headed back on the right track, at least in terms of its organization. But as soon as Pope Gregory XI died, all sorts of chaos broke out again. You see, the moment he died, the leading bishops, who were known as cardinals, they wanted a French pope. But the people of Rome didn't want a French pope. They wanted somebody from Rome. And finally, they had a compromise choice by choosing an Italian pope, but not a Roman pope. And that new pope was known as Pope Urban VI. 
Now that seemed like a good idea, an Italian Pope, but not a Roman or a French, but the French Cardinals didn't think so. They replaced him with a French Pope in Avignon, and so he refused to be replaced. So now they had not one Pope, but two Popes, one in Rome and one in Avignon. Well, in 1409, the Council of Pisa, which was in the Cathedral of Pisa, where there was a bell tower just outside that was already, even in 1409, tilting a bit, they declared that the church's oneness didn't depend on having one pope. They declared at the Council of Pisa that the church could make a decision on the basis not of a pope, but on the basis of a council. The councils, not popes, had the final say. And so the cardinal bishops that were gathered at the Council of Pisa, they deposed both popes, the Italian one and the French one, and they elected a new pope. But there is a problem still. The two depoped popes decided they would not be depoped. And so now they had not one pope, not two popes, but three popes, all of whom excommunicated all the followers of all of the other popes. And in the meanwhile, the Hundred Years' War dragged on, and many people became uncertain as to where to find the true church, because after all, there were three popes, and each one of them had excommunicated all the followers of all the other popes. And so where do we find the true church? Well, one answer came from a rather unlikely source, a philosophy professor at Oxford University in England named John Wycliffe. Now, according to the teachings of the church, only the church could understand, and only the leaders of the church could understand Scripture rightly. And Scripture was only understood rightly if it was understood in keeping with the teachings and the traditions of the church. Now, in some sense, Wycliffe agreed with that. But he said the church is not just the popes or the councils, and it's not just the leaders of the church or the tradition. Rather, he said the church is every person called by God to faith in Jesus Christ. And how could you know if somebody had faith in Jesus Christ? Well, according to Wycliffe, a godly life demonstrated outwardly that you were truly a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, what flowed out of this reasoning for Wycliffe was that every church member should strive to understand the Bible. And so Wycliffe and his followers began to translate portions of the scriptures into English so that anyone could read them. When someone asked him about this, why do you want God's word to be in English so that anybody can read it? Here's what he had to say. He said, Englishmen learn Christ's law best in English. Moses heard God's law in his own tongue, so did Christ's apostles. And so they translated the Bible into a language that people could understand in England. Now, some English people called Wycliffe a hero, but church leaders called him a heretic. And twice they tried to put him on trial, and political problems and natural disasters prevented them from doing this. And Wycliffe died of a stroke in 1384, still in good standing with the church. Now, after Wycliffe died, his followers translated the Bible the rest of the way into English. And throughout England, they shared John Wycliffe's message of reform. Now, his words traveled quickly from England, crisscrossing Europe, and around 1400, some of his ideas began to take root in Bohemia, the area that we know today as the Czech Republic. Now, the Roman Catholic bishops in Bohemia, they banned Wycliffe's writings, but there was a man named Jan Hus, who had already embraced Wycliffe's ideas. Now, this encounter with Wycliffe's ideas would cost Jan Hus his life. He began to proclaim Wycliffe's understanding of the church and the scriptures from his pulpit in Prague. And in 1407, the church revoked Jan Hus's right to preach, and yet Hus refused to hush. He kept on preaching. He kept on preaching what he had understood, and he claimed that people should obey the church only when the church obeys the Bible. So Jan Hus began to make some radical claims for his time and his place in history. He claimed that the Pope was not the head of the church, but that Christ was the head of the church. The bishops and councils were what made up the body, but everyone whom Jesus Christ had called to himself being the body of Christ. And he was finally imprisoned in a castle in the city of Constance and brought out for the Council of Constance, at which time he was turned over to the state, declared a heretic to be burned alive. And he said, I appeal to Jesus Christ, the only judge who is almighty and all righteous, and in his hands I place my cause, because he will judge each one not on the basis of false witnesses and erring counsels, but of truth and righteousness. Some of the last words that he spoke were, Lord Jesus, please have mercy on my enemies. They placed him on the stake, they burned him alive, and he died singing psalms. 
And even though John Wycliffe had been dead for several years by this time, they also dug up his bones at the Council of Constance, and they took them and burned them as well and condemned John Wycliffe as a heretic. But the Council of Constance did do a few things that were helpful for the Roman Catholic Church, at least at the level of maintaining order. After burning Huss alive and burning Wycliffe after he was dead, the councils imprisoned the Pope who had been appointed by the Council of Pisa. They deposed the Pope who had been the one in Rome. They retired the Pope in Avignon and they had a brand new Pope. And by 1450, not too many years later, the great papal schism, this great division in which there was not one, not two, but three Popes was over and they were back to one Pope again. But already there were movements toward more radical reform. People had begun to question where is the true church in the midst of this time of three popes and more radical reform started to occur and people began moving toward wondering where is the real church and could it be that people can read scripture and look at scripture and understand it for themselves. Now even as the Roman Catholic Church was finally pulling things together in some sense, in the eastern side of the empire, things were falling apart. In the year 1453, the Ottoman Turks surrounded the city of Constantinople and prepared for a final strike, and that was all that was left. The city of Constantinople was all that was left of the ancient eastern empire. On May 28, 1453, as they prepared for that final strike on the city of Constantinople, several of the citizens gathered in the Church of Holy Wisdom for what would be the last service of Christian worship in that building. And they worshiped there together and shared the Lord's Supper together amid the candles. And for a few moments, the Roman Christians that happened to be in Constantinople and the Eastern Christians forgot the ancient division between them. On May 29th, the very next day, the Muslims conquered the city. And when night fell, a Muslim scholar walked up to the Church of Holy Wisdom and declared, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. And the church building was turned into a mosque. Now, during this time period when the Eastern Empire fell, thousands of manuscripts were taken by Eastern scholars from the East all the way over to the West. And these manuscripts were Greek manuscripts of the New Testament and of many, many other documents. Now, for many centuries in the Western half of what had once been the Roman Empire, they hadn't had a lot of access to Greek manuscripts, especially the Greek New Testament. Now remember, Greek was the language in which the New Testament was originally written. And so what they were getting when the Eastern scholars came to the West was words that were very close, even identical to those words that Paul had originally written in his original letters. They had access to the words as they were originally spoken and written of the New Testament. Now already at this time, there was an interest in ancient rhetoric and ancient art and ancient manuscripts. And suddenly they had the manuscripts, they had access to them. And this era of interest in ancient things became known as the Renaissance or the rebirth. It was a rebirth or Renaissance of interest in Greek rhetoric and art and writing. Now the scholars of the Renaissance, they became known as humanists because they focused on how can we understand what we understand in a way that is practical for human beings? How can we make it practical for life? And Christians that were humanists considered things that way too. As they read the Greek New Testament, as they looked at these documents, they focused on the original intent and the original language of each text and asked themselves, how can this apply in people's lives? But see, this alone would not have triggered the changes that actually occurred. Something else happened as well. Around the midpoint of the 15th century, a man named Johannes Gutenberg came up with a way of having movable metal type and making manuscripts not by hand and not even by carving or pounding out one large plate, but by having movable metal type where each letter was individual and could be reused and rearranged in different ways. And the result of this was, the result of the Gutenberg printing press was that the price of books plummeted. And soon, even though books were still extremely expensive, they could be accessed by many, many more people all the way across Europe. Now, unfortunately, the popes of the Renaissance, even though they supported Renaissance art and Renaissance, this the Renaissance of literature from ancient times, they didn't focus very much on the revival of interest that was happening in the text of scripture. In fact, the very first pope of the 16th century didn't even take a saint's name when he was elected. He took the name of the pagan Caesar, Julius, and called himself Julius II. And he was a warrior pope. 
1507, he took back all of the Roman church's lands and rode victorious into the city of Bologna, Italy. Now, there was a young humanist in Bologna, Italy, when he rode in, who wasn't that impressed with what Julius II had accomplished. And this young humanist said, whose successor is this, Julius Caesar's or Jesus Christ's? This young humanist was named Erasmus, Erasmus of Rotterdam. Now, as a teenager, Erasmus had longed to study Greek at the university, but he had no money, so he studied for the priesthood instead, and eventually he became far more than a priest. Now, Erasmus was an incredibly promising scholar, and his bishop saw that. And so he sent him to the University of Paris to study Greek, and soon Erasmus was studying all over Europe. And that's when he saw Pope Julius II ride into the city. Now Erasmus, that frustrated him, it disgusted him, and yet despite all of his denunciations of so many things that were going wrong in the church, he didn't want to split the church. He simply wanted to transform it. And one of the things that Erasmus did that became a catalyst for later reforms is he brought together the best manuscripts that he could get of the Greek New Testament and developed a Greek New Testament that was published in 1516. And so now Christians could read the words of the apostles in the original language after Erasmus published his Greek New Testament. Now we're in 1517, calm seemed to be settling on the Roman Catholic Church. Pope Julius II was dead. Pope Leo X was the new pope, and he declared when he took the papal office, God has given us the papacy, now let's enjoy it. And why not? The Western Roman Church was unified, didn't have three popes anymore as they had for earlier. Constantinople had fallen. The paint was fresh on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. St. Peter's Basilica was under construction. Christopher Columbus had just gotten back from his fourth voyage to the New World. But while Leo was declaring, let's enjoy the papacy, there was a young monk who was seeking the gospel that would bring peace to his soul. And while this young monk was seeking, he ran across a book of sermons by Jan Hus. And when he ran across this book of sermons, he declared, I was overwhelmed with astonishment. I could not understand for what cause they had burnt so great a man who explained the scriptures with so much gravity and skill. A few years after reading these sermons of Jan Hus, this young monk would also be reading Erasmus's Greek New Testament, and a spark would be lit in the young monk's soul, and Martin Luther's words would be heard. Okay. All right, uh, let's take a 10 minutes break or at least 10, five minutes break. I need to take a break and we will continue our study. But uh, before we do that, notice that in the video, uh, it was mentioned by Dr. Paul Jones that uh, the importance of the Gutenberg printing. The Gutenberg printing caused, uh, first of all, uh, the, the book, the Gutenberg Bar Bible was a, uh, uh, Jerome's Latin Bible, but it, the, the fact, even though it wasn't translated to the vernacular languages, the fact that the Bible, the book can be purchased at much, much cheaper price, uh, plant the seeds for the Reformation movement, and later on, the writings of Luther, his 95 Theses, the, his uh, translation of the Bible into uh, German language were printed by the uh, printing uh, devices uh, invented by Gutenberg. So you see that was a great explosion. Con you know, you, find, you can find a similar event in our time with the invention of internet that now, uh, you know, I can access uh, areas inside Iran or Afghanistan through internet and send Bibles and the explosion of the uh, uh, in the media technology through internet and computer and digital devices. Okay, let's uh, stop here and take a break and we will come back. All right. Okay, I'm back from the break. I hope you guys are doing okay. Uh, let's continue our session. Uh, and in this part, I want to focus as much as time we have on John Wycliffe, John Haas, and hopefully we can get into Martin Luther also. Uh, it's important to, uh, in order to understand the Reformation, it's important to look at 
uh, two figures, pre-reformers. One is John Wycliffe and one is John Haas. As he was talking in our uh, previous session on uh, chapter one and also in the video, we talked to him, referred to both John Wycliffe and John Haas. Wycliffe uh, was a philosophy pro pro professor at Oxford University in 1360 and, from, and uh, he was an educated man. Um, in 1370, Wycliffe became Oxford leading philosopher and theologian. Um, and his main idea, the thing that he was dealing with was the idea of a lordship. In other words, where does the uh, uh, dominion comes from? And uh, basically he maintained on one hand that the ungodly have no right to rule. On the other hand, the godly man possess all the wealth of the universe. His first point is simple to prove all lordship is granted by God, but he doesn't grant it to those who are in rebellion against him. Um, okay, then um, so the second point follows from the fact that the godly man is God's son, God's child, and so shares his lordship. Uh, so on the one hand, they justify the rejection of the unjust ruler and confiscation of their goods. On the other hand, the universal lordship of godly has important implication. Uh, the lordship must be shared with the rest of the godly. Uh, it's kind of, <laughs> you can see almost elements of socialism in that. Uh, one of his, you know, he had to um, the kind of uh, clarify some of his position. Uh, for example, he believed in uh, predestination, but he recognized that uh, you cannot hear and now judge who is elect and, and who is not. And between you cannot uh, decide between the elect and reparate right here on this earth. But he believed that sinful living uh, shows that the person is not elect. Um, and he applied this theory particularly to the clergy and was uh, in favor of removing clergy and uh, taking away from them any kind of a, a church privileges. An area that he was kind of was supported by uh, rulers in England was the uh, issue of taxation. Uh, you know, during Wycliffe's time, the church was very wealthy, and one third of all lands in England belonged to the church, uh, but it claimed uh, exemption from taxation. And Wycliffe doctrines, you know, that lordship doctrine that God gives the uh, dominion uh, uh, only to godly, not to the ungodly. And if there are ungodly church leaders, then they must be removed and their property uh, taken over and they should be taxed. That gave rise to, um, you know, um, a good opportunity for um, temporal uh, uh, authorities in England to try to tax churches. Um, um, the King of England had to finance his wars with France and uh, they wanted to use, uh, um, he wanted, they, they wanted to use Wycliffe's in negotiation with papacy. Uh, remember we talked about what was going on between uh, Boniface VIII uh, later on. Of course, this is much later after Boniface VIII. And, uh, but the rise of these uh, temporal Monarchs Edward, uh, um, uh, uh, Philip the Fourth in England, in France, and others uh, wanted to tax churches. And Wycliffe idea that because they are ungodly, they cannot claim exemption. Uh, and Wycliffe was in a delegation sent by the, um, the the British monarch, England monarch, uh, in 1374 to uh, discuss the situation with papal authorities. Uh, he, he was condemned by papal authorities, but he enjoyed a favor 
of the uh, British government. Um, excuse me. Um, Wycliffe uh, doctrines and teaching came to the ear of the Pope in 1377. He condemned 18 of Wycliffe's statement in the series of bulls. Now this word bull that you may hear call for, comes from the Latin word bulla, means official decree. So when you hear the bull, uh, you know, it comes from bulla, a Latin word for official decree. Um, when the great schism happened, that gave opportunity for Wycliffe to work on his uh, doctrine of theology and sharpen his attack on the theology of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, unfortunately, what happened in 1381, there was a peasant revolt. You see the same kind of event happening for Luther and one of its leader, John Ball, was reported to be the disciple of Wycliffe. Even though the Wycliffe disowned the revolt, but the damage was done and that caused that uh, in a way that he lost the support of the uh, British monarch um, in England. Um, now, the thing that made Wycliffe so controversial was uh, that, you know, he wasn't the, the first person in the Middle Ages to protest against the corruption in the Roman Catholic Church. The, the thing that made him so unique was he was the first one who broke the new grounds in attacking the doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. The doctrines that underlie the practices of the Roman Catholic Church, and especially, <clears throat> especially with the theory of the Lordship and the, the importance, the necessity of being godly. He said that, you know, uh, the, that ungodly have no right to rule. God only grants lordship to the godly. Two areas that I wanted to talk about quickly, one is in his relationship, his view of the scripture, and then uh, his view of papacy. Uh, in regard to scripture, we can take, we can make six points regarding Wycliffe's position. Uh, he believed he maintained, in accordance to the church, church teaching, that the scriptures are true. The scriptures, uh, both Old and New Testament, are free from error or any contradiction. So you can see the belief in the inerrance of the scripture going way back, even before Wycliffe, but Wycliffe was the one who articulated that here. Number two, he maintained that the Bible contains the whole of God's revelation. It contains the whole of God's revelation. Therefore, there is no need for any further teaching. There is no need to further teaching, uh, any kind of a decree to supplement the scripture, any further uh, teaching supplied by the church tradition, Pope, or any other sources. The scripture contains all the, the complete will of God, and it, con it contains all that is necessary for salvation. Okay, so number one, he believed in the inerrancy, infallibility of the scripture. Number two, that the Bible contains the whole, whole of God's counsel, whole of God's revelation. Therefore, we don't need Pope's decrees and all that. Uh, number three, the Bible contains all that is necessary for salvation. You see, these are all the foundational teaching for later on for Martin Luther and Calvin Zwingli and others who started the Protestant Reformation. Um, um, he believed that all authorities, tradition, canon law, remember what was the canon law? Canon law were the laws uh, written by uh, like a, lawyers of the church, legal advisor of the Roman Catholic Church that would uh, uh, control every aspect of 
the, uh, the members of the church. Uh, Wycliffe believe all other authorities, tradition, canon law, councils, even Pope, must, their teaching, their decree, must be tested by the scripture. So that's the fourth element. The scripture is infallible, first one. <clears throat> scripture contains the whole of God's revelation, second. Third one, the scripture has all that is necessary for salvation. Fourth one, all other authorities, popes, whoever, whatever they're saying, they're saying if it's going to have any credibility, any authority must be tested by the scripture. So uh, then Wycliffe uh, clearly anticipated the position of the Protestant reformers. So uh, finally he came to this point that the Bible is to be available to all Christians, uh, the laity as well as clergy. So that's the fifth point. He believed that the Bible, the scripture must be available to all people, which leads to the sixth point. It must be translated into the ver uh, vernacular languages, the common languages of people. People can read them and understand them. That's where he comes with the uh, idea of his followers uh, which uh, the people called them the low lords or mumblers, but they, they were actually disciples of John Wycliffe, would go on to different parts of England and teaching in plain language the gospel, the teaching of the New Testament. Uh, <clears throat> and you know, the, 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 it is these laurels that tries to uh, Protestant reformation in the 16th century. And much of English Reformation in the 16th century owes its existence to these low lords, these mumblers. And in fact, uh, Wycliffe ideas through these low lords uh, were uh, transferred to Bohemia and influenced John Haas and uh, had a great impact in uh, Reformation movement in Bohemia or the present Czech Republic, even though it ended with the uh, you know, the constant, uh, the, the, the Council of Constance uh, um, ordered the killing of John Haas. He was burnt at the stake in 1415. Okay, now we also regarding papacy, uh, there are three points that I wanted to make of uh, Wycliffe's teaching and the papacy. Um, as he also, you know, Wycliffe was uh, uh, exalting the role of the scripture, he downgraded the role of the papacy. Uh, you know, he, during the time of the great schism, when there were two and then three popes excommunicating one another, that gave time and opportunity for to John Wycliffe to work out his theology and his attack on the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, but even the scene of these rival popes uh, excommunicating one another uh, was just an embarrassing situation and a more uh, proof for Wycliffe uh, position and, um, and motivated Wycliffe to, uh, to press on his point that you know, this, these people cannot be vicar of Christ on earth. Uh, in 1379, Wycliffe wrote the power of the papacy. He argues in that, that the papacy is an office instituted by men and not by God. Uh, more important, the Pope authority is not automatic, but dependent on his having the moral character of Peter. You know, the idea that in papacy they say we are uh, uh, you know, descendant and inheritant, uh, we inherit the authority from Peter, Peter being the first pope, which that itself is wrong idea. But even if, even if we accept that, okay, the, um, Wycliffe says, okay, if you are saying you are in the line of Peter, you must live like Peter. You must have the moral character of people, Peter. Uh, the authority of papacy is not automatic. And a pope who doesn't follow an example of Peter or doesn't follow the example of Jesus Christ is not the pope, is not the vicar of Christ, is the antichrist. 
And then he later on moved even to saying the whole institution of papacy is the Antichrist. Now here, of course, not just on the side, uh, you get the idea that you know there are some, even in our time, there are some theologians, some individuals, uh, when it comes to interpretation of the book of Revelation and the uh, concept of Antichrist, they don't notice and they don't recognize Antichrist is referring to one individual, but to an institution such as papacy, which is which is wrong. Um, uh, the Antichrist that is mentioned in the Book of Revelation, and you know also in the Book of Daniel, refers to an, a specific individual. Now that that whole institution uh, is corrupt, no doubt about it. The, the papacy, uh, but um, what I'm trying to say is this custom, this habit of applying the title Antichrist to an institution goes back to Wycliffe. Uh, so he um, downgraded the role of papacy. Uh, he, number one, he argued that papacy uh, is an office instituted by man, not by God. Number two, he argued that the authority of Pope is not automatic, but depends on uh, the Pope having the moral character of Peter. Number three, he rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation. Transubstantiation was the idea that when you have communion, or as they call it, Eucharist, meaning Thanksgiving in Latin, uh, <clears throat> uh, as the priest uh, blesses the element and says he's in Latin, he's prayer, the, you know, what happens that the, the, the bread and the wine, uh, they change the substance, change to the body and the blood of Christ. You know, the substance changes, but the accident, meaning the physical character, the look and the taste stays the same, same but the essence, the substance becomes the body and the blood of Christ. So, that's why, you, that's why you get the idea that each time you have the, the communion or Eucharist, uh, uh, or they, and they call it sacrament, not ordinance, uh, you actually have a repeat of Calvary, which is completely wrong. Wycliffe rejected that. Wycliffe argued against that and said that there is no basis in the scripture that shows that uh, the essence of the bread and the, uh, the wine uh, or the, uh, the grape juice uh, changes to the body and blood of Christ. And he said this idea actually is a new idea. It's formulated in the 13th century and it's against the scripture. He attacked the concept of uh, transubstantiation. So, but his books, his writings, especially through his followers, the Lollards were transferred to Bohemia, and that's where the influence on the Bohemian reformer, John Haas, comes. Now, let's now go to John Haas. John Haas, uh, uh, um, he lived in 1372 to 1450, the late 14th, beginning of the 15th century. Um, um, he, at the Council of Constance, uh, which brought the end to that great schism, also uh, sent John Haas to a stake, burn him on a stake. He uh, <clears throat> confessed to be the disciple of Wycliffe, uh, but uh, uh, there are some areas that uh, Wycliffe's influence was limited on Haas, especially on the area of the transubstantiation. Haas didn't reject that, but he was he joined Wycliffe on the corruption of the church, um, and he was, you know, in contrast to Wycliffe, he was a member, just a member of the uh, ongoing movement in Bohemia. 
and uh, his follower, the Hussites, uh, you know, they were pre-runners that anticipated the reformation of the 16th century. Um, uh, he was born, as I said, in 1372 in Bohemia. In 1390, he moved to the University of Prague. Then he studied there. He got his Bachelor of Art degree. He got his Master of Art degree. Later on, he became the preacher at the Bethlehem Chapel in Prague. And amazingly, two sermons were preached each day in that church. That's just something. Um, the, no, the, the influence of uh, Wycliffe on uh, Haas and the, uh, the Bohemian movement, you got to understand that there were links between England and Bohemia. Since the marriage, there was a, a King Richard II of England married and of Bohemia. Uh, in 1401, uh, a man named Jerome of Prague brought back to Prague from England a number of copies of books and writings of uh, uh, Wycliffe and his followers, the Lollards, and You know, the whole uh, Wycliffe's attack on transubstantiation wasn't very much in favor with Hussite, with John Huss or Hussite, but um, uh, they, they, Huss, John Huss and majority of Bohemian reformers actually remained loyal to that doctrine. Um, but it was the attack of Wycliffe on the corruption in the church that attracted Huss and his followers. Um, he, he agreed with Wycliffe on the, you know, that uh, the true church is a church of the elect and it's invisible. It's not the uh, institution of the Roman Catholic Church uh, in uh, Vatican. Uh, and uh, uh, and this was crucial because it laid the foundation for the rejection of the authority of the wicked church leaders uh, for their appeal from the institutional church to the Bible and saying that uh, the true church is invisible, it's form of the believers, uh, the elect. Therefore, when there are uh, wicked church leaders, they cannot appeal to the institutional church, but uh, any true authority must come from the Bible. Um, uh, you know, in 1412, the tension with the papacy came to head. Pope John the 22nd launched the crusade against King of Naples and was even offering full remission of sin and he wanted to finance his war but uh, through selling of the indulgence, uh, but Huss attacked that practice uh, and that caused uh, Huss was excommunicated by Rome and even the city of Prague was, pla uh, was placed under an interdict by Rome. Interdict is when a pope poops, uh, puts the whole region or a country under excommunication. There, that means that you cannot do any religious service, no baptism, no funeral, no marriage, and that creates lots of problems. Uh, Haas uh, wrote uh, two, uh, two of his important works, uh, The Church and the Simony, meaning buying church offices through money uh, during this time that he was uh, excommunicated by the Pope. And in 1414, he uh, met at the uh, Council of Constant. Uh, the Council of Constant dealt with the Great Schism, but also condemned him to be burned at the stake. Uh, some of the charges made against him were untrue, such as claim that he denied transubstantiation. He was not against that. Uh, so in July 6, actually today, July 6 is the day that John Huss in 1415 was condemned for heresy 
taken to the outskirts of the city of uh, Prague and was burned alive. Now, uh, his followers, uh, the reform movement wanted to maintain, uh, wanted uh, for people to receive both the cup as well as the bread in communion. In the Roman Catholic Church, uh, the cup was reserved for the clergy. Now, <clears throat> if we had the uh, opportunity to have this discussion, I would ask you, do you know that in the Roman Catholic Church, uh, in the communion, uh, or maybe even, even today, even in our time, they do not give to the laity the cup. They can only participate in the communion by taking the bread, and it's only in rare occasion, maybe a special event, whether it's on Good Friday or Easter, that they give the, both the bread and the cup to people. Now, do you know why? What's the reason? Why is it reserved for clergy? The idea goes back to the doctrine of transubstantiation, because if you believe that when the priest comes and says his, uh, whatever he says in Latin, uh, and the elements, the substance of the bread and wine uh, transform, this is the word transubstantiation, the changing, the transfer of the substance happen and becomes the blood and the body of Christ, then what you have in your hand in those cups are actual blood of Jesus. So why didn't they, why did they didn't want to give it to um, uh, the lady, uh, the cup was because of this, that they thought that, you know, somebody may, hands may shake and spill the blood. And, you know, it was kind of a blasphemy that, you know, oh boy, you know, I spilled the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, <clears throat> And somebody, when I remember, I taught that in a class, somebody said, but how about the bread? Uh, they, uh, well, how, why they would they give the bread to people? Well, they don't. They don't give you the bread. If you ever attended, not that I encourage you to do that, uh, a communion service by the Roman Catholic Church, what they do, you will go there and you, you line up, you come to the priest, you open your mouth, and they put the bread or the wafer or whatever they call it in your mouth. They, they don't give that to you either. Um, so it's, it all goes back to the idea of the, the doctrine of transubstantiation because they believe these are trans, uh, they have changed, they've been transferred, the substance being transferred to the body and the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, wanted to emphasize on uh, Wycliffe and Haas because they laid the ground for the future reformation in the 16th century. But now let's go to our chapter two. And let me go to share screen. Okay. Okay, now uh, in chapter two, uh, two things that we emphasize uh, is one is Renaissance humanism and humanist at fonte. At fonte means going back to the fountains, going back to the uh, sources. Uh, happening in this area of time, this period of time, uh, you know, when you think of a renaissance, it means rebirth, rebirth of culture, uh, painting, you know, the great architecture. Uh, uh, what you have in Renaissance humanism is appreciation for knowledge and culture of antiquity uh, emerge with a culture deeply rooted in a long Christian tradition. 
So you have Christian humanists who apply humanistic learning and methods to support, not to undermine Christian faith. And you have the humanists at Fonte who uh, wanted its, its basic approach to studying ancient texts of the earlier manic manuscript created an interest across the Europe in learning Bible's original language and biblical study, textual uh, study and textual criticism. So you have the uh, combination of the humanistic learning and biblical study uh, uh, led to, uh, to reforming the church because it exposed people to the scripture and that opened the eyes of people to the corruption in the church and laid the ground for the uh, belief and the, uh, many, lots of the actions of the Protestant leader. You know, you have this term, a European Renaissance. Um, first time it was used by Michels in his book, History of France, um, uh, the word Renaissance means rebirth, cultural rebirth. Uh, we have the, in the 14th century Italian thinkers who talked about this Renaissance as a cultural rebirth after the, that period of the advers adversity and cultural darkness. Um, so, um, and it's actually, you know, when we talked about, uh, there's a question that have risen over how widespread the artistic, literary, and cultural innovation of our Renaissance humanism actually were. And there's always a tension between uh, how much we can use from uh, pagan philosophy and uh, apply it in Christian faith. Um, you know, Christian humanism defend the, uh, the idea of studying uh, books and the work of the pagan thinker. You know, in the whole idea of a Christian Renaissance and uh, Christian humanism is that we can be benefited by studying the books of uh, non-believers not to accept everything they say, but to understand why they oppose Christian faith. What are the point, things that they uh, uh, point out regarding the weaknesses of Christian faith? And we can use their analytical thinking in our own understanding. Now, for example, in, in our time, for, uh, I encourage you to read the books of uh, this French philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, definitely He's not a Christian, uh, but nobody can deny his intelligence and we can learn from him. And even, you know, Nietzsche, uh, these individual Nietzsche who came with the award that God is dead, why was he so upset with the Christianity of his time? There are many things that we can learn from them. So uh, this renaissance of humanism was not anti-Christian. A humanist idea uh, was not anti-Christian, but they were against the scholastic thinkers of his, their time. The scholasticism, remember I just mentioned, uh, emphasized heavily on human logic. The Renaissance humanistic thinkers say that we must go back to the ancient texts and a study based on the texts and draw our conclusion there, not just pure human logic. Um, in my opinion, as I mentioned, I believe we need both of them. It's just the difference between deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning. The humanist uh, Renaissance were more inductive thinker that they wanted to go back to the ancient texts and study them and draw their conclusion based on that. Uh, there has always been tension between uh, whether we should only, you know, the time of Tertullian, what does uh, Aten had to do with Jerusalem? Well, uh, we can learn and we can be benefited and this tension shouldn't be there. 
uh, of course, you must go through the filter of the scripture. Um, there were challenges raised, and even uh, there was theologian Petrarch uh, the, who supported, he defended the benefit for Christians in studying the works of pagan thinkers. Again, you know, you've got to be deeply rooted in the scripture and study their work and, uh, and learn from them. You can, we can learn from people. Uh, same way that through the contact during the Middle Ages between the scholars in Europe and the scholar, Muslim scholars in the Middle East, uh, caused the scholastic movement and then the Renaissance movement in Europe. They learned, they were benefited from even the Muslim scholars. So the, uh, the Renaissance movement um, or Renaissance humanism started uh, originally in the city of Florence in Italy, then moved to other parts of Italy and from Italy to other parts of uh, Europe. Um, and uh, that created appreciation for learning from antiquity, literature, art, uh, you know, the work of uh, scholarship of Petrarch and Saluati. Uh, they sought manuscript from Latin, from Greek antiquity. And the whole idea of, as I mentioned, the term, at Fonte, going back to sources, uh, whether pagan or Christian, came from this period of time, uh, going back to source. And this is a seed that is planted that later on uh, started the Reformation movement. This whole idea of going back to sources, whether pagan or Christian texts, uh, put a great emphasis on textual criticism. That's why you have somebody like Erasmus who came with this, this wonderful work, the first uh, analytical uh, research Greek New Testament that became the basis for translation of the Bible in many languages and was a great um, you know, uh, life-giving bread. You know, when you know, they used the, his Greek New Testament translated to a different common language of people, and that brought a revival in Europe. Uh, great interest in textual criticism, in philology, study of words, their roots, their history, linguistic details. Um, that was their interest. The scholastic movement, their focus was on logical argument. And that, that's a tension between these two, which again, as I said, in my opinion, is a difference between um, in inductive and deductive reasoning that doesn't need to be there. Uh, okay, here, um, I put this question, should Christians study the work of pagan thinker? Uh, I hope you will answer. Uh, my, my answer is yes, definitely. I would, uh, I don't accept you know, first of all, I need to be rooted in the scripture, but I welcome challenge from people who even oppose my Christian faith because by looking at them and study them, I can learn why they became so anti-Christian. What, what are they saying? What, what is their criticism? Maybe there are some valid points in their question. And of course, in all the cases I have discovered the problem that they are facing is they are mixing the teaching of the New Testament with the teaching or practices of some contemporary Christians. Now, these are two different things. But I would say you will benefit from the study of uh, the works of the pagan thinkers. Um, we had Christian humanists, uh, Lorenzo Walla, uh, they uh, wanted to uh, show that their scholarship is in harmony with Christian faith. Um, uh, they sometimes reach conclusion that challenge acceptable principles of the church, the Roman Catholic Church, which is fine. So you have Christian humanists. Um, okay. 
Okay. So we have also the discovery, the age of discovery, discovery of the world and discovery of the man. Um, uh, now the issue here, there was one issue that came was a controversy, uh, controversial and synchristic perspective. You know, you have Lorenzo Vola, Christian humanism, and man's goodness. Uh, they, they try to do textual analysis to question certain doctrines of the Roman Catholic Church. The problem, what I mean, and let me explain what I'm trying to say here, is there were these Christian humanists who argued that the writings of Aristotle's, Plato's philosophy reflect primal theology. Uh, that predates Christian scripture and unites biblical teaching with certain teaching uh, of pagan thoughts. Now, this writing uh, creates a heterodox idea, a synchristic perspective. You are trying to mix different things together. But if you go back to the scripture through textual analysis, you can bring harmony, you can filter some things out, reject some things out, and bring things together. But the idea that was, uh, the, whole, the thing about Christian humanism was the idea of man's goodness. Uh, you have others like this guy, uh, Marcelio Fissioni, the Platonic Academy, the unity of biblical teaching and certain pagan thoughts. Okay, um, now here is the thing that you got to be careful. You know, they believe in man's goodness. So eventually this Christian humanistic movement went off the track and emphasizing too much on man's goodness, what do you deny is the original sin. So if as the, you know, again, I'm not against studying the uh, works of the pagan writers. And I think it's wonderful and I think it's, you can learn from them, provided that you have a strong scriptural filter to filter things and pick the right things and reject the wrong things. And also to understand their criticism of the Christian faith. The, the, you know, their emphasis on textual analysis caused to question some of the doctrines of Roman Catholic Church, which is fine. Um, they wanted, you know, they called uh, Plato's uh, philosophy as primal theology, and they wanted to find biblical the unity between biblical teaching and pagans taught. But here, when the emphasis is, was given too much on man's goodness, eventually in later centuries, that led to denial of the original sin. So if you deny the original sin, then you don't need an atonement and you don't need a savior. You just have to be the good person. That's where um, you end up with having, end up with liberal theology that you see rising in the 18th and 19th century. These Christian uh, humanists, they consider their work as Christian. Uh, and again, their approach was, uh, they wanted to provide the alternative curriculum to a scholastic school. Um, okay. Renaissance educator, they understood immersion in classics of pagan and Christian antiquity as something that complement each other rather than undermine the Christian faith. Uh, too many. <laughs> These calls. Um, humanism continued to meet resistance from scholastic. Uh, theologian who approached theology as a science rather than 
heavy of wisdom. Uh, now, you have others like Krimolo Savonor, Savonor, Savonarolo, who encourage destruction of any kind of Renaissance work, any kind of art work, which was for ancient philosophy, which came from pagan mind. Now that's another character that I wanted to focus. Uh, Grillo Mauro Savonarola, the, and the rise and the fall of Florence. Um, I don't know if you know about this guy. In my opinion, he's a dark, dark figure, an image in church history. He was an Italian, uh, Dominican, a friar, uh, and a preacher at the city of Florence, the same city that this whole uh, Christian Renaissance movement started. He, he was known for his prophecies of civic glory and the destruction of secular art and culture and his call for Christian renewal. He denounced clerical corruption, yes, uh, despotic rule and the exp exploitation of the poor. So that was the thing that gave him popularity. But he also denounced the Florentine Renaissance for its profane work of art. He considered the work of art profane. Uh, in his opinion, the only proper art was biblical. Biblical art produced to help illiterate uh, Christian to understand the Bible. Uh, he would burn books and uh, uh, his followers in 1497 collected and burned thousands of objects such as cosmetics, arts, and books of Florence, Italy. Very controversial person. I compare this guy to uh, Islamic fundamentalist movement like the uh, Taliban in Afghanistan or ISIS who would go and destroy uh, you know, the ISIS, um, when they took over you know, a few years ago in Iraq, they would attack the, this museum and destroy the work of art, archaeological work and paintings, and cause lots of damage. Uh, so this guy, Gorilla Molo Savonarola, is a, in my opinion, is a very dark image in church history. Uh, what do you think about him? Again, that's a good, good question, but I don't have a whole lot of respect for him. Now, so this idea of the Renaissance movement and the um, uh, European Renaissance Christian humanism started from the city of Florence, moved to other parts of Italy. Um, uh, you have these adherents of Christian humanism in different parts of Italy. Uh, Renaissance thinking spread beyond, but it spread beyond Italy too. Uh, it took uh, distinct traits of various countries where it went in Germany. Uh, effect of that was invention of the uh, printing press by Johannes Gutenberg, who published the first, one of the uh, first books that he published was Latin Drones Bible uh, in uh, 1450. And uh, he introduced movable types and printing press that reduced the cost of uh, publishing a book and became a great new medium for rapid spread of Renaissance ideas. Uh, now you can have new edition of classical text and uh, translation of Bible in popular languages. They just pulled out in a print shop in different parts of Europe. And that helped supported the creation of many universities and universities were um, hospitable to humanistic learning that appeared in different places. Um, now, some adherents of Christian humanism emphasized biblical authority and imitation of Christ. They emphasized a, uh, inner piety. So we have Gutenberg uh, and the publication of the Gutenberg Bible and then uh, Inner Piety uh, and a great book. I encourage you to buy that and read is a book by Thomas Kempis, The Imitation of Christ. 
And this is reaction to scholasticism. You know, scholasticism, which had its place, and again, I don't reject it, but it was kind of a cold, pure, logical argument. Now these groups who are saying uh, we need to have to have inner devotion and we need to uh, follow and imitate the example of Christ. In my opinion, you can have both. Why not having both of them? There were other forms of Christian humanism uh, in Catholic scholars, like uh, this guy Erasmus. Uh, he never uh, separated himself from the Catholic Church, uh, but he was a humanist and pursued biblical study, uh, and that uh, led him to concern uh, for corruption in the Catholic Church and wanting reform. And he's the guy, Erasmus, uh, he carefully researched and produced a new edition of the Greek New Testament in 1516, which became the basis for Martin Luther uh, translation of the Bible in uh, Germany, in German language in 1522, and many other languages. Uh, the Erasmus, um, uh, uh, let me see. Erasmus edition of the Greek New Testament became part of a, a basis for more um, the accurate and better translation of Bible to uh, vernacular languages. Uh, and th th the study of the scripture led to Protest Protestantism and the Reformation movement. Um, the Protestant, uh, the leaders continue to value humanistic learning and recognize the importance of classical books, the study of biblical languages, which is wonderful. And it's interesting during this era, in spite the fact that there was anti-Semitic movement in Europe, you have a movement called Christian Hebraism, uh, uh, learning Hebrew language to study Jewish literature that was an interesting thing during this time now there as far as renaissance men and women are concerned unfortunately the women in general had little access to the opportunities in education work and leisure uh, in comparison to men and even uh, whether gender then also uh, these uh, opportunities were more for wealthy families than the lower class. Um, so uh, majority of European experience Renaissance indirectly. Uh, there were individuals such as Christina de Pizan challenged the patriarchal nature of her society and learned living as a writer. Okay, so I believe, uh, but Renaissance movement was mainly an elite movement. Um, it is difficult to separate Renaissance ideals from Christian civilization. Uh, you have Christian humanism, study of scripture, and the reform, you know, going the ad fonte, going back to sources, going back to the text of the scripture, the Erasmus New Testament, uh, Greek New Testament, they all are planting the seed for the Reformation that is coming in the 16th century. Uh, let me see, I think that's the end of this one. Let's stop here. Okay, I have about uh, 15 more minutes. We can go to chapter three and start on Luther. And part of that we have to leave for next session, this first session, because we have to go over the syllabus. It took about 25 minutes of our time. So let's go 20, 25 minutes to the next. Uh, uh, okay, let me go to chapter three.
Okay, just uh, Okay, sorry. Um, okay, we come to Luther's Reformation. When we try, when we come to the Reformation, you got to remember the Reformation movement uh, gave rise to four streams of thought. One is Lutheranism. Another one is what we call, or the Protestant Reformation gave rise to four stream of thought. One is Lutheranism, uh, another one is Reform or Calvinism, uh, and the uh, third one is the uh, Anabaptist movement, and the fourth one is uh, Anglicanism, uh, the Reformation in England. Let's start with Luther. Um, you know, there's this popular image that, you know, he came and uh, nailed his 95 theses um, uh, on the Wittenberg uh, church door um, and uh, uh, challenging the Catholic church. This is not uh, accurate. Luther wasn't trying to overrun the church, but to serve it by raising some concern. And, um, uh, but uh, he, what happened was his 95 thesis was became translated um, and to many languages and also to, because of the Gutenberg printing uh, device uh, they were printed and it was sent all across Germany uh, and that this situation coincided with that there was already a widespread dissatisfaction with the church abuse and that's why you know luther just you know different things joined together in other words there were already trends and different streams of dissatisfaction going on and luther came in in at the right moment god's uh, providence and uh, 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 so that's why he made Luther as an instant hero suddenly. Uh, he was originally planning to study law by his parents. His father wanted him to study the law, but uh, some traumatic event brought young Luther to monastic life, much to the displeasure of his parents. Uh, Luther was ordained to the priesthood in 1507. Uh, he was under the tutelage of Johannes Stoppitz. Stoppitz, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing it correctly. Um, and uh, he, uh, this, his, um, uh, uh, the man who was uh, in charge of overseeing uh, Luther, arranged for this young monk to teach at the University of Wittenberg. He became a professor of scripture there at 1512. Um, and um, there were debate going on um, uh, and there are, you know, even right now, we don't know exactly when, but eventually he, uh, he arrived, Luther arrived at his doctrine of justification by faith alone. Not that he, um, made that, but he came to the understanding of that from the scripture. Um, he understood this doctrine in a legal terms and made a clear distinction between justification and the sanctification. And, and that appeared uh, the full understanding 
found and distinction between justification and sanctification appears in 1530 in the writings of Martin Luther. Um, Luther was reading Augustine works. He studied the scripture. He, that led him to reject um, uh, uh, the concept of the Roman Catholic Church can grant salvation through merits and in particular, he came to see in Roman chapter 1, verse 17, when it talks about the righteousness of Christ, or righteousness of God, he came to understand that as not as a divine attribute, but rather as God giving his righteousness to sinner who come to faith in Jesus Christ as a gift of faith, imputed righteousness. You see, and again, this is very important, the distinction between justification and sanctification that's the thing that causes stumbling block for many many groups and churches if well those of you who were in the first portion of this course the church history one remember when we were studying regarding the eastern orthodoxy we said in the eastern orthodoxy the concept of salvation is really it's in the process of what they call theosis, meaning becoming like God. And again, not that they are not thinking the way, same way that the Mormons are thinking, but they are thinking that uh, growing in Christ likeness in the image of God so that you become uh, worthy to become a part of the family of God. So again, if you notice in Eastern Orthodoxy, in, in the Roman Catholic Church, the, in the, even in the Roman Catholic Church, it, it, they don't use the concept of the imputed righteousness. Uh, they use the concept of imparted, but not imputed. Um, you may think that what's the difference? There's a big difference. In other words, they believe, the Roman Catholic, that there is a righteousness in you. Now you must develop that through either uh, you, know, you know different sacraments different um, uh, religious duties that you do at the church and uh, that righteousness which is in you develops to full salvation what Martin Luther and others like him and he's not the only one again remember there were smaller group like Valdensian and different group who believed from the scripture that salvation is a gift by God. It's only through faith. Uh, let me see, I'm sorry. I apologize. Um, but the thing is, in all uh, churches and groups that there is a problem in their understanding of the Bible the main area is right here that they cannot see the distinction between justification and sanctification and that's why they end up with work salvation it, whether you are in the Eastern Orthodox or Roman Catholic or more uh, I mean the Mormons were having a serious problem I mean uh, in all you know in false religious groups uh, sorry um, um, it's always a work salvation because they tying these two areas of justification and sanctification together and there's no distinction but the key thing in, under, in a the correct biblical understanding, a key thing to understand, Luther is his distinction that he came based on Romans 1 7, that a sinner is imputed, and the word imputation is an uh, accounting term. Uh, the righteousness of God is being poured into your life because of faith in Jesus Christ. And that is distinct from sanctification, growing in Christ's likeness. That's very important to understand. Uh, biblical salvation and Luther's uh, view of uh, salvation.
that's a basis of actually evangelical Christianity, biblical Christianity, that justification is distinct from sanctification. I'm not saying, and Luther wasn't saying that a person is justified and live a wicked life, no. But I'm saying that uh, justification is different than sanctification. Okay. So Luther came to see the righteousness of God in Romans 1.17 as a gift, God's, not a, not a attribute of God, but a God's clothing sinners in Christ's righteousness through the gift of faith. So it's imputed righteousness, and it's the only basis for justification. Uh, now, again, one difference with the Eastern Orthodox was, if you notice, these terminology are very legal terminology, which is fine, nothing wrong with that. Uh, they accept that Eastern Orthodoxy says that what it needs to be included, which is included, is the image of God that needs to be restored. And we say, yes, that is included in the sanctification, not the justification. Um, this is considered evangelical belief uh, because they believe they recovered the gospel, the evangelion. Um, now, when this issue was presented that unleashed the Reformation and uh, um, the, the, but the challenge that came for Luther and for the Catholic Church you know, going back to what I said in the beginning, you know, that the idea that Luther was against the church, no, he wanted to serve the church, actually. He wanted to draw the attention of the papacy to some misuse, came uh, at the point of uh, the campaign that the Roman Catholic Church has started to raise money by selling indulgences. You see, there are two, uh, two things that you got to remember. There are eternal punishment for sins and then temporal punishment for sin. The Catholic Church teaches that through Christ's merits, his life, his death on the cross, his resurrection, the eternal punishment of sin are removed, but there are still temporal punishment of sin that you, in order to satisfy that, you need penance. Uh, to reduce your time in purgatory, which, uh, of course, there is no concept of purgatory in the Bible, but these are the teaching that uh, they gave to people, and when you don't have the, the scripture in the language of people, uh, they cannot check what you're saying. So, remember, you have eter the eternal punishment of sin, temporal punishment of sin. The eternal punishment in the, and I'm talking about Roman Catholic system. In the Roman Catholic system, the eternal punishment was uh, taken care of and paid through penance. Um, uh, through the, the eternal punishment was uh, paid by the merits of Christ. But you have the temporal sin. Uh, you have, in order to pay for that, to satisfy that, and reduce your time in purgatory, you have to do penance and buy indulgences. And uh, so the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church claim that they have a power to dispense merit out of what is called the treasury of merit, the excesses merit of Christ and the good deeds of saints. And they even said these indulgences, not only you could buy it for yourself, but you can buy it for your deceased relative. And Luther point out that these selling of indulgences have no biblical support. His um, uh, clash with the Roman, with the Papacy came at this point, with a guy named Tetzel, uh, his famous word, once the coin into the coffer, claims his soul from purgatory springs. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, uh, so that's where the tension came between Luther and the Roman Catholic Church that led to others. So he wrote <clears throat> his 95 Theses, 
Um, and in that, he even in his 95 thesis did not reject the concept of indulgences. He did not reject the sacraments of penance or traditional Catholic doctrine. But there was social and political factor that magnifies Luther's action beyond what he initially intended. So the, the people were excited over what they saw. Here is our German hero. He's a German priest defying the oppression of the Italian church. So they came around him. <clears throat> um, and you know, his action was considered as a front to papal authority. Uh, the next year, the Luther presented his, uh, some of his thesis at the Heidelberg Disputation. Uh, and uh, at that place, he pressed more explicitly his criticism of their church theology and practice. Uh, and that eventually led to confrontation with Rome. Uh, he uh, initially agreed to submit to papal authority and cease public hostility. But in a meeting that he had with Johannen Eck, uh, the, there was a debate at Leipzig in 1519. There was explosive exchange between them. And Luther denied the infallibility of the church council and Eck declared Luther as heretic. Now, what was happening in Germany, Charles V became the supposedly Holy Roman Empire in 1519. Uh, uh, and, you know, that uh, diverted the attention of the church and empire to political issue. So that gave time to Luther uh, to set up his bold conviction into writing, publishing, he published four important works in 1520. One on the papacy of Rome, then the address to the German nobility, third, the Babylonian captivity of the church, fourth, and the freedom of the Christian man. So Luther in his writing attacked Rome's claim to be the only true church and equated the claim of papal infallibility with Antichrist. Okay, um, uh, defended the priesthood of all believers, rejected Roman teaching regarding the mass and challenged the sacramental system in general. Uh, then uh, he was called uh, again uh, to a, uh, you know, a, 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 all these things caused that on June 15, 1520, the Pope issued a decree and um, the, the declare Luther to recant or to be excommunicated. And Luther in Wittenberg uh, came before a crowd and burned the uh, uh, documents sent by the Pope and was officially excommunicated on January 3rd, 1521. So he's declared heretic. <clears throat> he's summoned to the Diet uh, of Worm or Diet, <laughs> that actually means the Council Diet of Worm, not a strange Diet. Diet of Worm, a name of city in Germany, to receive a hearing from the Emperor. Uh, there was a popular support uh, for him. Luther refused to recant. Uh, we can from his position, and therefore he was decreed the outlaw of the empire. So now he's both an heretic and the outlaw. So uh, now at this point, again, God's providence, uh, a powerful supporter of Luther, Elector Frederick the Wise intervened, kidnapped Luther, and hid him at his castle. Wartburg Castle from 1521 to 1522. Uh, Luther stayed there as younger George, and during that time, he worked on his translation of the Bible into German language and 
finish the German translation of the New Testament based upon uh, Erasmus Greek New Testament. Uh, Let's see. You know, um, <clears throat> I think we better stop at this time. I'm way over my time. So if you don't mind, we stop right at here and continue the rest of this discussion next week because there are lots of good things about Luther. I don't want it to just go quickly and so let's stop us this time and continue our study next session. The Lord bless you all. Hopefully I will see you next time. Okay, let's stop share.